Welcome to Water of Life Online. We are so glad that you are tuning in for today's message. And you know, here at Water of Life, we believe in having passion for God and compassion for people. And so we're so glad that you're with us today. For more information about our church, from our service times, to the ministries we have available and more, you can check out our website at wateroflifecc.org. And of course, if you wanna stay connected with us throughout the week, make sure you follow us on our different social media platforms. Well, we're so glad that you're here. We hope that God speaks to you, that he encourages you, and we hope that you are blessed by today's message. It sounds like we're at a football game. Oh wait, what football game. It's good to be with you guys this weekend. So um, <clears throat> today, and now if you're watching this later, uh, maybe they'll just cut this out and you don't have to see it. But today is January 29th and it is a special day in the Carroll household because it's our daughter's birthday today. She's the big four. She doesn't, uh, this is, she's not even here. So <laughs> she's over there running around with your kids. So uh, it is fun for us because she's the only girl. So we gotta, you know, gotta have good times with that. So. Hey, it is a good day and it is a good weekend and we hope you enjoyed um, celebrating baptisms. This is something so important. I wanna just highlight this before we jump into the conversation today, that there's moments like this that are sacred. I don't know if you felt that when you were sitting in here. Some of you walked in going, what's this church thing about? And then you felt something, you went, hmm, what's that about? And no, you, it wasn't your coffee. Listen, there are moments that God sets apart to do powerful things in people. That happened last Sunday night in here as we prayed and we worshiped together. But but the truth is he sets those moments apart to say, you are mine. And those people said, I am yours today. And there's something life altering and destiny changing about those moments. And we never want to run past those moments. So now my name is Shane. If we've not met before, I'm one of the teaching pastors here. And it's good to be with you this weekend. And um, a couple of years ago uh, on uh, New Year's Eve, I came in here. I taught the New Year's Eve service. And then I went back to where my family was having vacation. They were away. And so I drove home, did it, drove back, and got back so late that all the restaurants around and everything were closed. And guess what? I was, bingo. I had a couple more days before we would start fasting and prayer. So I wanted a burger and fries. I just did. And uh, so the only, the only restaurant that was open, the facility they were staying at, was this little like barish thing that was in the middle of all the hotels. So I walk in there, it's New Year's Eve. So it's like, you know, 8, 30, 9 o'clock at night on New Year's Eve. So I'm just trying to get my way in. It's the only place to eat on the facility. And so I walk in, I find one stool at the bar where I can sit down and just order food. They had like a full service menu at the bar. So I sit down, I'm like, oh. And I'm looking around I'm like, oh no, it's going to take me forever to get food here. It's going to be midnight before I get to eat, you know. And you, got, you ever have those thoughts? You're like, you just see what's going on in the restaurant. And you're like, this is going to be all bad. <laughs> so I, I sit down, not paying attention to who I sit down next to, and sit down next to this person. And they've been enjoying their New Year's Eve for a while. And, uh, <laughs> and she and her husband, or her, I think it was her husband, were sitting next to each other. I was sitting next to her, and she just starts talking to me, like casual, like, oh, we're sitting at the bar, let's have a conversation talk. I thought, oh, I just want to get my food and go back up to my room. Uh, but happy New Year's Eve to me. I got to wait for my food to come. So I'm sitting there, we just kind of small talk, and you know, she's very loquacious at this point in her evening, and she's just chit-chatting away and start talking. And you and I have all had this experience before, maybe not this exact same one, but we've all had this experience before where they turn to you and say, so what do you do? What do you do? Now, when you're sitting in a bar and a guy leans over and goes, well, let me tell you about what I do. <laughs> It was awkward. And uh, <clears throat> I said, well, I'm a pastor. <laughs> that, you, you probably have a better story than I do, but mine's pretty good. When you lead over and they're like, what do you do? And they have no idea who you are, no idea what you do. And you go like, I, well, I work at a church. Well, what do you do at church? I'm, I'm a pastor. 
I just wait now. I just wait just to see what happens here because it's always interesting. It's either like they've totally deconstructed their faith and want nothing to do with church and you are, you know, you might as well be, you know, Satan. Or, or they're like, how fascinating. And I become a creature of like just total imagination. They're like, tell me more. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so... This didn't happen that night. We did share a little bit. I encourage you to read this book because she was in a journey like some of you are in where she's trying to figure out what her life's purpose is. And so we're going to kick off a series this weekend called Your Life, Your Work, Your Destiny. And really this comes out of a text from a guy named Tim Keller who's a fantastic, really intelligent pastor and a book called Every Good Endeavor. And we'll post it online later if you want to read it. It's a fantastic book. It's a little bit thick. And he really writes from a very theological perspective. But he does a great work of helping us begin to identify what God's plan for work is, what really the goal of work is, what God wants us to do with work, what our problem with work is, and then how do we walk that out and be faithful in work. And now by work, I mean work. Not just doing hard things, but actually your vocation. We'll get to that in a second. But here's what we all know. At some point or another in our journey, if we're doing work well, work is what? It's hard. This is the problem with work, right? It's, come on, you can say it with me. It's hard. It's hard. Some of you are like, no, it's not, but that's go to work. I'm kidding. Your parents paid me to say that. Now, the reality is work is hard. And here's the problem. As we lean into these moments, the question we have to wrestle with internally, each of us, is what has God called us to? What does that look like and how do we wrestle with it? Because reality is work is hard. The problem is that with work, we're often dissatisfied, aren't we? Only one person is honest, but that's okay. The problem is, right? And the outcome, see, we have a problem. And the outcome is the reality is work is hard. The problem is, is that it's hard. But here's the outcome, and that we're dissatisfied. The outcome is this, is that we live with the propensity to compare. And that propensity to compare looks like this. How many times you scroll through your phone or look at the person that sits a cubicle over or look at that person that's a little higher than you in the organization go, if I could just be them. I could just have their, actually a lot of us just want their paycheck without their responsibility, but that's a different conversation. If I could just have their paycheck or if I could just have the, the value that other people have for them placed on me, I would be okay. But let, let's be honest, would you, re- would you really? The truth is, is we wouldn't. And here's the real question for us is, what if, um, what if we viewed our calling in this life? Now I'm talking to Jesus Foster, calling in this life as your vocation. Now, I'm going to say this to some of you. Some of you are here today journeying, trying to figure out your journey with God or you're in a faith journey. You're just not even sure what you believe. Here's, here's the thing you can lean into and thing that might bring you hope. And the rest of this will be good advice, but it may not bring you the hope that you need today. And the hope that you need today is this, is that you were created with a purpose, for a purpose, to live your life as an act of worship to a God that is not you. Now, I know that's offensive, but the rest of the people around you are going to be cheering and they're going to be excited today. This is my way of prepping the crowd. But... They're going to do that and you're going to kind of sit around like, why? And here's why, because they are hoping and believing, not always living this out. They're trying to figure it out, hoping and believing that they could live in a way that their life would reflect the glory of the God that created them. And in those moments, you're going to be confused. And this is just, we're just going to tell you, here's why. Because we really, God created us with a purpose, for a purpose, that our life would be an act of worship back to the God that gave us the breath of life. We just sang that a few minutes ago. Here's the thing. So some of you are joining us from Upland and you didn't have baptisms today and we, we missed you. But those of you in Australia too, this is, this is a Western culture phenomenon about the way that we view work and we view life. And I want to read you something because Tim Keller kind of sets the pace for this entire thing and I want to give him credit where credit is due because his thoughts here are great. But let me read this to you and then I want to pray for us as we get going. Work and lots of it, millennials, Gen Z, hang on there. Work and lots of it is an indispensable component in a meaningful human life. It is a supreme gift from God and one of the main things that gives our lives great purpose. But it must play its proper role in this life and remain subservient to the creator. 
I joke with you millennials and Gen Z, but I am millennial. I shaved my gray off today so you could, I could claim to be millennial today. But I want to pray for us. <laughs> See, there you go. I want to pray for us because some of this is going to touch some places that are hard because what we do know is this, is that what we do often shapes our identity in good ways and sometimes in broken ones. And so, Father, we want to stop right now, offer this moment to you. This belongs to you. This space belongs to you. We belong to you whether we recognize it or not. We want to ask that you come and you be faithful to meet us, to shape us, to heal us in the places that we're broken and then give us a perspective that looks a little bit more like yours about why we are here. Not just me or not just us, but we collectively are here. So God, give us the grace to hear what you're saying today. Give us the courage to walk it out in Jesus' name. And everyone said... What if we viewed our vocations as calling? I kind of teased this idea a second ago, but what if we did? I know for a lot of us, and those of you who are Bible people, you can turn your Bibles over to Genesis chapter two. And the, the thing is, what if we looked at that? And if you look at kind of the, the etymology of the word vocation actually comes from a Latin word, which you're like, oh gosh, get me out of here. Vocare, which actually means to, it's not gonna be a surprise, to call. To call. So the thing that you call your vocation, historically throughout time until the modern era, really has been a thing that you identified as your call. These are all things influenced by the church and things by God. But so your thing that you do, the thing that you are gifted, the talent, the resource, the thing that you are given, the things, that, the abilities you were given were called a calling. Meaning this, it wasn't just about doing something, there was somebody making the call. Today, we are so divorced from those things. We're so divorced from that line of thought because really most of us, our thought is, how do I make more, work less, and feel better so I don't have to do any more? <laughs> but here's the lie in this whole process, and we'll get into this, is that we think by doing less, we will feel better. Here's the problem with leisure. Leisure is a lie. Rest is not, so let me just be clear. There's a theology of rest that a whole bunch of us need to embrace. And some of us need to set aside because we call it rest, but it's actually leisure. And I don't wanna to get too far into this, but what if we considered our work as opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus? I know some of you are going, hold on for a second. You don't know what I do. You're right, I don't, but Jesus does. And he put you there with a purpose for a purpose, to borrow Rick Warren's phrase again, with a purpose, for a purpose. It's not an accident. Some of you think it's an accident that you are where you are. If that is true, then you can't come in a place like this and sing that God is sovereign over all because that means he put you or didn't put you in the place that he did. So here, let's just tease this out because there's a picture in the very beginning of what that looks like. And I'm gonna have you read part of it with me, but before we get to there, I wanna kind of set this up and have a conversation with you about what well, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he kind of teases this out in this whole worldview idea. And we'll get there in a second. He says this, always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. And let me just kind of walk this out for you. Here's what he's saying. The promise is if you lean into your vocation and you do what God has called you to do and you do the things that he has called you to do and live as if you are doing unto him, it will never be fruitless. No show of hands, but how many of you go to work every day and think the only thing that I get out of my job is a couple pennies at the end? And you're like, every year there's less pennies because the government keeps taking more. <laughs> we feel this way, right? And we'll talk about this in a second, but it feels like a necessary evil. But let me back up here because I want to touch something. If we considered our work as an opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus, if we viewed our vocation as the deepest opportunity to love our neighbors more than make money. Now here's the problem with that. You don't like your neighbor at work. You don't like your neighbor neighbor. You don't like the neighbor that sleeps in next to your bed. How are you going to like the neighbor at work, right? Come on, this is, we got to challenge ourselves. We can't joke about this here. We can't joke about this anywhere. Listen, the first person that bothers you in this life is not the guy that lives down the street. It's the person that lives in the house with you. And over and over and over again, the thing that Jesus says to us is love your neighbor as your, and he says, by the way, wink nod, Paul tells us this in Ephesians chapter five, your first neighbor is with you. And here's a question. 
What was Jesus saying? What was God saying? What was creation telling us in Genesis chapter two? Because Genesis chapter two sets a conversation that gives us the whole picture and answers this question, why do we work? And why do we work is a, is a tough one because a lot of us have very, very, very diverging opinions about why we work. Here, here's what Genesis chapter two says, and it's gonna come up on the screen behind me and it'll be on screen for you online. And so if you're around, it'd be great if you could read this with me. You guys good to read this with me? I heard the people at home, good job. It says this, so the creation of heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation. So he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. The Lord placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. God got tired, did you see that? I'm kidding, God doesn't get tired. Here's the thing, do you think this is there for God? God doesn't need scripture to remind himself of who he is. This is for our benefit. What he's saying is, by the way, I rested, so can you. See, for a lot of us, the seventh day is just another day for progress, right? And God's saying, hey, I didn't need to rest, but I did anyway. And you do. Some of you pride yourself. I worked 92 hours yesterday. (laughs) You're so excited. You're so proud of yourself. And and your body is like, I'm dying. And your family's like, we don't know you. And your bank account's saying, it's not worth it. Here's why. Here's why. Because in the beginning, there was what? There was work. So hear me out. I'm teasing some of you workaholics, but here's the thing. There was work in the beginning. You got part of this right. And every good thing taken too far becomes a destructive, broken thing, right? Just like rest taken too far becomes leisure that becomes lazy, that becomes, listen, participation and destruction because you're no longer forming yourself and participating in creation like we've been given the invitation to do. I know you never thought about that, but just just pause for that. Most of you who are parents have figured this out. The first time you held one of your children in your hands, you realized that you were staring a little bit at the face of God because he invited you into the creative process. Now, some of you have never thought about that, but do you realize that your placement here on earth is to, as we see here in Genesis chapter two, is to participate in the continued cultivation and rulership of the earth. Meaning this, you got invited by creator to participate in creation. Let that sink in for a second. Some of you don't think you have any purpose, but somehow you got stuck here on this ball of dirt with a plan that you might participate in the thing God started all those years ago. And you think you don't matter. And he's sitting up there going, yes. I'm walking alongside of you just like I did Adam and Eve in the garden. I'm saying, yes, yes, you have a purpose. I want to do something. But here's the catch. This is a partnership. What does Psalm chapter 127 tell us? Unless the Lord builds a house, those who build it, build it in what? In vain. So you maybe had this read at your, at your wedding or if you had a water of life wedding. We read this all the time. Here's why. Because if you try to build your home, your family, your career... If I have to see one more self-help blog on Instagram from people who claim to follow Jesus and say they're going to make their own way, I'm gonna throw my phone through the wall. Here's why, because we are believing a lie that creation has told us is a lie. The lie is you can make your own way. The good part of these things, and don't, if you're one of those bloggers, don't, sorry. My dad say, you don't send me an email, don't inbox me. Okay, <laughs> kidding, you can send me all the inboxes you want. Here's the problem. Here's the problem is that it's a good thing taken too far. Instead of cultivating the gifts and the resources that you have, you shine yourself as the purpose for the purpose. And when we do that, we begin to divorce ourselves from our participation in creation. We begin to cultivate one space with one thing. And here's what we know about ecology. The garden picture is always a picture of the connectivity of what God requires of people and of nature. Here's what you know. You can't grow alone. So if we tell ourselves we are going to do this on our own, what we're saying is I am prepared to grow momentarily and die in the long run. And here's what God's saying to us. Listen, the call I place on you is to participate in the work of creation for the greater good of all. 
not just one. I'm getting ahead of myself here because what we know is work is essential to humanity flourishing mentally, physically, and spiritually. Everything we study today tells us scientifically, I know that this might mean something to you, this is not a surprise to those of you who follow Jesus for, for a season or for your life, that work is essential to humanity's most flourishing, listen, mentally, physically, and spiritually. It gives you purpose, listen, it gives you outlets for your body to discover what it can do, or your mind, and here's the other part. Spiritually, it nurtures, grows, and matures us because it gives us the opportunity to participate in something that God is already doing. Now, some of you are saying, I stare at spreadsheets all day. There's no way God is involved in that. And I would agree with you. No, I'm kidding. Uh, we have a running joke around here when I have to stare at budgets and stuff. I'm like, somebody tell me what's going on. I, you know, give me a book. Give me anything but Excel, just not Excel. Some of you are gifted in that. Praise the Lord. He, Here's a joke. Some of you think there's no way God has positioned me to do that, but here's the thing. The question that we're going to get to today as we finish this and throughout this series is, are we doing work that is contributing to the good of all humanity? And that doesn't mean that you got to go like feed every kid in Africa. I'm not talking about that. I'm, here's a, is what you're doing contributing to the betterment of humanity and our culture or not? There's some of you that are going to have to wrestle with this. Some of you are sitting at home. Maybe you see this later. Some of you may have to answer that question no and rethink what you do with the talents and the gifts and the resources God has given you. But most of us, we are in the midst of doing creative work with the creator and we are missing the point because we forgot he put us there or we've never acknowledged it. And you're doing great work that is benefiting all of humanity or at least a segment of community and culture and cultivating something you didn't realize you were doing it for him and for them. You thought, I got a paycheck. And Jesus said, don't live for a paycheck, live for a purpose. One that I gave you, one you can't create, that I cultivated for the beginning of time. Now here's the problem with work. Here's the problem with work. And you might agree with me, you might not, and that's okay. But here's the problem with work. See. One of the things that we wrestle with is the, the work versus play thing. See, Jesus, or excuse me, God does give us a picture of work and rest, doesn't he? It says he worked six days and then he rested on the seventh. He rested one. So here's the thing we got to kind of sit with. Some of us don't rest and you don't think, you think, I am not a person of the Old Testament. I'm not under the law. You are absolutely right. But this isn't about law. By the way, Genesis pre-law. Don't miss this. This is a rhythm thing. This isn't a legal thing. This is God saying, I designed you with a rhythm in mind. And some of you are sitting here right now. I'm probably preaching to the choir. You're like, yeah, we're at church, resting, getting, growing with God. So everybody that's watching at home later, just kidding. <laughs> no, no, come on. We, we have this thing that we miss. And it's an invitation from our creator to rest with him. We've done series on Sabbath and what Sabbath means and all of those things, but just here for some of you would dismiss me as not willing to work hard. Now listen, we work hard. We should work hard. And then <laughs> you pull up and you pull up and you rest. Why? Because God created you to. Because we're not smarter than he is. And he said it. We said this earlier, if you remember, you said it, I'll believe it even if I don't understand it. So let me move on here real quick. Work versus play. See here, the problem with leisure, I said this before, is leisure is different than rest. Um, God commands rest on the fields and as he begins to build the legal precedent for what happens to Israel, if you read the, the Old Testament, he, he gives a command of rest every seven years, the fields wouldn't be worked. This is a rhythm that God has placed in creation. Don't miss this. And you are not an exception to his rules. His principles, not law, his principles about how he designed you. Don't miss this. Some of you, some of you run into a wall. You end up with an emotional breakdown or something and you look up and you realize I have not tied back to God the time that I have, which is one, listen, just get this. Your Sabbath is you tied him back to God saying, I trust you with my time because you gave it to me and it belongs to you anyway. I'm gonna honor what you do and believe you will take care of the rest. I know we talk about tithing your money all the time, but have you thought about this, that God is asking you to tithe your time? 
to rest and be with him, to, to sit in community and sit in relationship and allow him to shape you because of what's happening out there. Listen, if you haven't come to the determination that you need time alone with your savior to make sure that your heart and your life are reshaped in his image before you go out there, I don't know where you go, but the world I live in, and I live in a bubble, I'm a pastor, I get that, but the world I live in, I gotta know that I am ready to go. So, here's the last part. Divine rhythm, and I wanna get to the next thing. Listen, without work, we will never experience meaningful life. But we can never say that work is the meaning of our life. I know you're like, come on, pastor, you're just contradicting yourself. No, no, you know. The thing that is so hard for us in this life today is that everything for us is really easy when it's binary, isn't it? When everything's one way or another, it's really easy. Here's the problem. Most of life lived well lives in tension. The tension of I need to rest and recognize God has called me to rest but also to work and that my identity is in my work but I find my calling in my work and you live in that tension so it never takes over. The thing that should alarm us is when things get a little bit easy, it's like, oh, I totally had that figured out. You should, all the bells and whistles should go off for you. All those things go, hey, no, 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 no. No, you, if you're leaning one way or the other, you're probably in danger. You're probably in danger of missing what God's trying to do with you in those moments. So here's a couple things. The way that we view work, for some of us, like all things in our, in our life, work is what? It's broken. It's broken. If you're new around Water of Life, we just kind of like to admit that we're broken. We just own it. We're failed people and we are in need of a savior. That is literally the creed of the church. But not just Water of Life, the church. Like we are people in need of a savior. God rescued us and he has a plan for your life. This is just why we talk. So when we say work is broken, we're just saying we know it's broken. But that doesn't mean God doesn't do great work in the midst of brokenness, which is a good amen and hallelujah for every single one of us because when we say things like this, that God is with you and that his God is going to use you, he's using broken vessels to do whole things. Yes. Now here's, a, here's our problem. Our current worldview on, uh, on work goes something like this. Maybe this is yours, this isn't to make you feel guilty, but this is just to further the conversation for you when you go home or eat in and out or whatever you're gonna do. Our current worldview on work tells us that work is a necessary what? Evil. Some version of this, the only good work in this view is work that helps make us money. So we can support our families and pay others to do menial work. That is when you've arrived, right? When you're like, I don't have to do that, I will pay you to do that, right? But in this, in this framework that, don't miss this, in this framework, Work is a necessary evil to give you the goods to do what you want to do. It violates the very core of who you are. Here's why, because it says, this thing isn't important. Work isn't important, vocation isn't important. It just says, vocation is a necessary evil to arrive at the place where I have what I want to do what I want to do. Don't don't miss this, because you're divorcing yourself from your calling and your creator. Here's the second version of this. Um, this one get a little more personal. The second version of this, the second problem with and brokenness and work is it leads us to believe that lower status or lower paying work is an assault on our dignity. We have an entire, uh, some of my best friends are professors, so just let me. We have an entire university system in this country that is set up on trying to raise people's dignity, which is a good thing, but is giving a false sense of value. The false sense of value is if you get a degree, you'll be more important than somebody else. Anybody who says that they are better than somebody else has degraded everyone, not increased anyone. This is the issue we see in racial tension in our culture today. We see this everywhere. If I'm better, then you're worse. And here's the problem. Jesus didn't call us. Jesus follows us. He didn't call us to make ourselves better. He said, in fact, get underneath and serve so that others may feel the value that the creator has placed on them. Now, here's the problem. This is good. I primed the pump about you guys cheering me excited today. It worked. All right. Here's the problem with this belief that that lower paying and, and you know, maybe for some of you it would be kind of like labor intensive jobs or an assault on our dignity. Here's the problem with that. People take jobs, and this is the result of this. People take jobs that they are not suited for, aim for careers that do not fit their gifts, but promise higher wages and prestige. 
Here's what that actually turns into. You ready? They violate the very core of who they were created to be for the sake of a dollar. Get this. I know you're going to freak out on me here. Like, but my kids. Ah. Listen, you want your kids to do better. You don't want your kids to do better financially. You want them to have more purpose in their life. You don't. Listen, more dollars is not going to help your children. I, I spent more than a decade of my life with young adults. In the middle of college, post-college, trying to sort through what it meant to have purpose in their life. Usually by the time they got to me, there were one or two versions. One of them were the kid that was really wrestling, trying to follow Jesus, and they didn't know what to do because mommy and daddy were telling them they had to go to college because they had to get a high paying job, and that was going to be their safety. This is the tension they lived in. Or they had gone out to college, and they'd made a train wreck out of their life. Right? They went, and they did, you know, sow sow your wild oats and blah, 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 you know, all that good stuff. Yeah. And one of those two, I recognize the collegiate world and the university world has changed a lot over the last, even just two years. But just look at this tension here. This one is over here trying to chase Jesus and their parents are literally telling them, don't follow what God is telling you to do, follow what the dollar is telling you to do. Or safety, this is a better way to say it. Their parents are trying to keep them safe. And it's good to keep your kids safe. The problem is they're not kids anymore. They're adults that got to take risks and lean into what their savior is calling them to do. I think about this and this is not in your notes and this isn't part of the program. So this is free time for me. Your kids are going to be late. Um, <clears throat> you ever think about Jesus walking on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and he walks up to James and John and Peter. And he goes, come follow me. Now nah, you've heard this story before, right? Their dad was there. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, right? right? They walk up and Jesus goes, come follow me. And it says, immediately they dropped their nets and followed him. I'm pretty sure Zebedee was not okay. He was probably really okay because culturally speaking, like it would be an, really an honor for a rabbi to call your son to follow him. It meant their sons had arrived, right? But he still had the dirty broken nets sitting on the beach and they didn't even help. It's like... You can go, son, after you finish your day's work. But, but get, this, get this. They took a risk. See, purpose is always found in the midst of risk-taking. Not wild risk-taking. Spirit-led, thought-out risk-taking. This isn't about wild. I know some of you are like, oh, he said, mom. I'm going to, you know, no, no. Listen. This is, this is why we, we try to create rhythms in our church culture around fasting and praying, that we would have those habits in our lives that daily, weekly, monthly, annually, we would stop, we would fast, we would go, Jesus, what are you doing? Because here's the thing, risk but Jesus isn't really much risk. It might look like risk to everybody around you, but it's not. Here's why, the riskiest thing is to go do what you think is right. We have a theological term for that around here. There's no kids in the room. It's stupid. It's dumb. Here's why. It's dumb because you are contradicting the creator. That'll be... Last night, uh, Dr. Dan Stewart preached this message here. He used puppets as an illustration. That's sort of like Pinocchio telling Geppetto what his purpose is. I, think about this for a second. Could you imagine... A made doll telling his creator, no, this is what I was created for. And in fact, there's the Pinocchio story, right? Just, I know you're not Pinocchio, but just hear me out. Sometimes you got to let this stuff sink in because it is a picture of people defying their creator, striking out on their own, believing that they have the answer. And God wants you to take risks. Some of you, he has given great courage to. You're entrepreneurs and you've made the world a better place because you've taken risks and he has been with you. Some of you didn't realize that's what he was doing. You thought you were doing it. He's like, no, but I'm with you. And would you capture this moment? Would you remember that I am with you? See, Paul in 2 Thessalonians kind of gets into this conversation. I'm a little behind in time, but I want to I highlight this for you because 
Wisdom would tell us to be cautious of thinking of one another, one kind of work is above another. Here's why. Because by doing that, you say that God should have never created that person that way. Don't miss this. And you, maybe you have a labor intensive job or people have talked down to you. And at one point in my life, somebody told me I was gonna be their trash man. That was not my favorite moment. But, but hang on for a second. Here's why, because I believe this lie. What if I was supposed to be a trash man? Our culture has told me that is not a valuable occupation when my creator says, if I created you to do that, there's no more valuable place than you could be than to help people live healthy and safe lives. Listen, we miss this stuff over and over and over again. Some of you think that what you do by staying home and caring for your kids and doing those things is meaningless and has lost purpose. And your creator's saying, no, I gifted you to do this. Treasure these moments. Here's a, I know you're like, see, he talked about homeschooling. I didn't say that, okay. Here's what I'm saying, listen. We are called, parents, we're called to nurture those things in our kids. Adults, parents, career age people, dare I say retirees, your purpose didn't end the day you took your last paycheck and they gave you that windfall. Your purpose began when Jesus said, I gave you these things, that you may do good work in my name. Here's, here's, here's a couple of thoughts before I get kicked off the stage. Work was a command, and some of us need to hear that. Some of us are looking for the, the path of least resistance. We're looking for the way out, and I need to speak to you too. Listen, Genesis 128, then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill all the animals, or excuse me, and govern it, reign over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and the animals that scurry along the ground. He said, create, do work. So doing and ruling is our participation in the work of God that began at creation. God gave people the task of developing creation's potential. You and me, he gave us the task of making sure that the earth became all that it could be. If we see, that all, if we see work this way, it creates dignity for all work. First Corinthians chapter seven, Paul says this, each of you should continue to live in whatever situation the Lord has placed you and remain as you were when God first called you. This is my rule and for all the churches. Here's what Paul is saying is he's speaking to Jesus followers, not the world around them. He said, God has placed you. Listen, this is when we submit and surrender to the rulership and the lordship of Jesus. When we say we come into his kingdom, he's the king, we're not what he's saying. I placed you. We have a word for, or we have a phrase for that around here. It says, stay on your, bingo, there you go. God gave people the task of developing creation, but if we see it this way, listen, if we see it this way, it changes everything because what does he say? This word called, this kaleo, it's a word that we actually get ecclesia, church, for. It means to be called out. Listen, your calling is to be called out, called into the world, away from the place that God has created you and nurtured you, where you come back weekly and you rejuvenate yourself in your community groups and the places that you find life in your home and you are called out into the world to do great work for his sake. Whether it is a spreadsheet, or it is a trash can, or it is nuclear physics. I don't think we have one of those here, but we might. We do, have, uh, we do have some rocket scientists around. Here's what Paul is telling us. Paul is telling us, and Jesus demonstrates that work is our calling. Tim Keller said this before we close. He says this, he says, We are to see work as a way of service to God and to our neighbor. If we do, the rest of it falls in line. We see our value, we see theirs. Psalm 147, this is is David writing. He says, it says that God takes no pleasure in the strength of a horse or in human might. No, the Lord's delight is is in those who fear him. Fear, the word here, what he's saying is those who recognize God's greatness, his sovereignty, his authority, and his power over them. And he says this, glorify the Lord. O Lord, the God of Jerusalem, praise your God, O Zion, for he has strengthened the bars of your gates and blessed your children with walls. He sends peace across your nation and satisfies your hunger with the finest wheat. He sends his orders to the world how swiftly his word flies. Here's what Martin Luther said about this when he was commenting on Psalm 147. He said, God wears many 
masks. Here's what he's saying, the people that strengthened the walls, the people that strengthened the bars, the people that fed the people, they were the face of God doing work. Doing work. God talks about him and Psalm nurturing the fields. And I thought about this earlier, I thought, isn't it, isn't it surprising that we would stop and we'd have a moment where we would recognize that God works the fields and he provides and he provides and we don't think of God working the fields as menial or beneath us, do we? But when somebody else does, we think it is. But when they're participating in God's creative work to take a seed, which we can't do, by the way, we can recreate seeds, we can't make them grow. They're participating in the creative work that God put them there to do and yet somehow we look down on them and in order to make value for ourselves, we belittle them. Here's the thing, is we're belittling ourselves too because we're creating a construct that tells us that in order for me to be valuable, I have to do something bigger, better, and better than somebody else. When our creator would say, no, your value was established at creation because you're made in my image to do great work in my name. Here's a question for you as we close today. Have you ever thought that all of your life was to be an act of worship to your creator? All, all of your life. Not Sundays from 9.30 to, you know, if we go long, you know, 11. No. All of your life. From your dollars to your leisure, to your rest, to your play. Some of you don't think God likes play. He does. He wants you to play. He, he created space. He created joy. There's no, there's, it's never an accident that Jesus points to children and say, those who inherit the kingdom of God are like that. What he's saying is this, is those who have joy, they play, they experience nature. They experience each other. They laugh and they celebrate the goodness of creation. They do it in work. They do it in rest. Tim Keller says this in his book. He says, the question regarding our choice of work and labor and vocation is no longer what will make me the most money and give me the most status. The question we must now ask is how with my existing abilities and opportunities can I be of great service to other people knowing that what I do of God's will and of human need will bring great life to all around me. Would you stand with me right now? Yeah. <laughs> right now, if you're online or at Uplands or even at Townsville, your campus pastor is going to come and close for you. But those of you here in Fontana, I want to ask you to do something really quick. We're going to just take a minute. We sang a song at the end of worship right after those baptisms. I'm gonna ask us to just very brief moment, sing it again, but I wanna leave you with a thought to reflect on as we do. Where is your life not an act of worship? Where is your life a tension between what you can have and what other people are willing to give you? What is your life about you creating, not participating in his creation? Better yet, some of you, this isn't about pride. This is about insecurity and not seeing yourself the way that your creator does. You've been told a lie that you're not valuable because what you do doesn't make enough. That what you do doesn't provide enough or your skill isn't good enough. Yes, we should work with diligence. And yes, listen, being competent workers is a reflection of being a son or a daughter of Jesus. It should be. You should work well. But some of you have believed a lie that you are not good enough. And your life has not been an act of worship in the opposite direction of someone who's proud. Your life has been an act of worship or a failed worship because you don't think that God can do anything with you. So Father, as we stop for just a moment and we sing, and we point back to you what you've already given to us, would you give us a picture of how you see us? Give us hope that we could too, like we see Paul and Jesus tell us, participate in the work of creation for the good of all. That it would mark out us being disciples of you.
So Jesus, as we stop or as we're still, as we sing right now, would you reveal yourself to us? Would you speak to us? But we love you and we thank you and it's your prayer and we pray. And everyone said. You're the great I am, breath of life I breathe you in, even in the fire, I'm alive in you, you are strong. be still and say you are we can't just sing a moment like that or sing a song like that and not stop and say God would we would you help us let you be sovereign over all in us that in those moments when we're when we let you be sovereign we find value in all the things that you've given us all the things that you've given the people around us and in those moments we get to participate in something that you invited only us into You invited us to participate with you in creation and to make the world around us a better place. I pray that we would go with the knowledge that you've called us to do that. And Jesus, we ask you to give us the courage, the wisdom to know how to do that. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, before you go, before you go, some of you, this touched some places that are deep for you. And our ministry team is going to come up right now. We'll be up here to pray for you guys after. We love you guys. God bless you. Have a great weekend. Uh, We'll see you soon. Take care. Well, wasn't that a great message? You know, I say this all the time, but our hope here is that you wouldn't just receive information, but that you would experience transformation. And so we hope that you were transformed and challenged and encouraged by today's message. Like we mentioned, if you want to find out more ways to get connected to Water of Life, make sure you check out our website, wateroflifecc.org. But other than that, we love you guys. We hope you have a great week, and we can't wait to see you next week at Water of Life.